Welcome. We have a project going here that starts with the observation that the world is changing radically and rapidly and is having a major impact on governance. So we examine different parts of the world to see what is taking place there and different subject matters like climate change and nuclear proliferation. And then we try to put the pieces together and see what we might try to do about it. So we had a session on Russia a few weeks ago. Today we've been discussing China and the panel will be discussing China. On uh, November 13th, we're going to have one on information, information challenge to democracy and to governance generally. Condi Rice will chair it. And on this December 3rd, we have one on Latin America. Pedro Aspi, former finance minister of Mexico, will chair that one. So we're working our way along here. But we've had a fascinating day talking about China. And the panel is right up in front of you. And Gary Ruffhead has chaired this. Gary is a visiting fellow at Hoover. And before that, he was chief of naval operations. He had his first contacts with China in 1994 and has sailed in the Pacific many times and has been to China a lot since he retired as CNO. So Gary, take it away. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, George, and thank all of you for coming. As was mentioned, we had a terrific discussion today, and not only is it about China, but it's also how uh, technology and innovation um, are, is affecting China, and then in the broader context, what does that really mean? Um, superb panel that will cover everything from demographics uh, to the internet, to artificial intelligence, uh, unfortunately, the senior statesman, uh, Ambassador Stapleton Roy, who uh, was ambassador to China and to Indonesia, and I refer to as the, as the senior statesman when it comes to matters China, was not able to be here. He piped in uh, from Washington and added to the discussions that we had. But uh, what I'm going to do is to ask uh, the presenters of the paper that papers that have been posted to just give about seven to ten minutes of the key aspects of of their work and also how today's discussion informed or uh, touched on some of those key points. In addition to those of you who are in the audience here, um, we are streaming the uh, the session. And so when we get to the questions and answers, for those who are out in the Twitterverse, um, if you have a question, and I encourage you to tweet those in, and it is at hashtag governance project, governance project all run together. So without any uh, further ado, uh, I'll turn it over to Nick Eberstadt, who will talk a bit about demographics. Thank you, Admiral. Ladies and gentlemen, um, you can talk about what the demographic future is going to look like 20 years from now without being a charlatan or a lunatic. Uh, and the reason you can do that is because the overwhelming majority of people alive in 2038 or 2040 in a place like China are already alive there today. Almost all of the future workforce and absolutely all of the future pension population. Um, when you take a look at China's prospective future and you trace it back, take back the dots to today, a couple of things kind of jump out at you. Um, most of these have to do with the fact that China has had below replacement fertility for decades and extraordinarily low birth rates, in particular in the urban areas. Uh, in places that do sub-replacement fertility over long periods of time, you've got three things that happen. The first is that the workforce peaks and then goes down kind of forever, or at least as far as a demographer can see, unless you, don't, unless you have uh, compensating immigration. The same thing happens with total population a little bit after that, 
The third thing that happens, which is a bit counterintuitive, is that the place ages really fast. When I started doing demographics, I thought that it would be longer lives that would make for grayer populations. But arithmetically speaking, it's smaller families compressing the base of the population pyramid so they're a larger fraction of old people. We see four things, almost impossible to stop now, coming down the pike at us demographically in China. The first is the decline in the working age population, which of course grew really, really rapidly from 1978 until just a few years ago. Um, that was a tailwind for China's economy for decades. Now this is going to be a headwind. And China's working age population composition is changing in ways that economic planners might not wish for. Uh, the young blood, the 20-somethings, uh, that group, which is the best educated and the most tech savvy, is set to shrink, not just in relative terms, but in absolute terms. It's set to drop by almost 100 million persons over the next generation. Um, the only group that's set to grow at all is people my age. And um, I don't think that that's exactly what economic planners would have prayed for. Uh, the second thing which is happening, and which can only be stopped by some sort of uh, major league geocatastrophe, is the very rapid graying and aging of China. Uh, China's population planners tried to stop the population explosion, but there's one population explosion they couldn't stop, and it's going to unfold over the next generation, and that's a population explosion of senior citizens. Uh, that group is set to grow at almost 4% a year for the next generation, from about 135 million people now to well over a third of a billion. Um, what is going to happen to China's elder population in the generations ahead? The social welfare network, the government social welfare network, is rudimentary in rural areas. And families are, in some sense, on the retreat. Um, we're going to have to watch very carefully uh, what happens here, because it's not impossible that we could see a sort of a slow motion humanitarian tragedy unfold. Um, we get to the science fiction portion of the program now. This is the imbalance between baby girls and baby boys, the gender imbalance you all know about that started taking place in the one-child era. Uh, those baby boys and girls grow up to be prospective uh, bridegrooms and brides. And in the decades ahead, we're going to see tens of millions of, if pardon my using the word, of surplus men, of unmarriable uh, men in China. They're most likely going to be uh, uh, rural, less educated, less affluent. Um, how is China going to cope with this uh, situation? There's a big debate in international security circles, as I'm sure some of you know about this. Um, stay tuned. Um, finally, there's the whole question of what's going to happen with urbanization in China. Of course, the movement of people from the countryside to the cities has been integ integral to the absolutely spectacular economic growth rates that China has achieved, because people who are less productive on the farms have been much more productive in the cities. But migration with uh, Chinese characteristics involves the hukou system, uh, which some of you know about, uh, which assigns people a uh, registration place at birth so that peasants who move to cities uh, typically are not allowed to access social services or to bring their families. They may get paid less or get less compensation, be discriminated against. Um, this is making for a situation in large cities in China uh, where for certain age groups, the majority of working age people, let's say in their younger uh, early 30s and 20s, are outsiders, are in effect illegal aliens in their own uh, country.
Uh, it looks a little bit to me, when you take a look at this uh, you know, uh, in statistical charts, like uh, Soweto with uh, Chinese characteristics. Uh, we know what happened in Soweto. I don't think we know yet what's going to happen uh, with this circumstance in China. Uh, finally, one last thing, which gets us into a range of true speculation. This is the revolution that has been taking place in the Chinese family. Um, when we have extraordinarily low fertility in big cities for decades on end, we get to a point where there's a new family type emerging. Uh, only children begotten by only children. Uh, a rising generation of people, a cohort of people with no sibs, no cousins, no uncles, no aunts, only ancestors and maybe someday descendants. This is a radical change for China, uh, obviously a radical shock to China's uh, historical family-oriented culture, maybe this will turn out to be the biggest demographic change of them all. It's easy for me to describe. I can't tell you exactly how it's going to work, so stay tuned. Thank you. Nick, thank you very much. Um, that was only a snippet. You can imagine what Nick's uh, full presentation was like. It's just a fascinating topic. Uh, the next uh, presenter is uh, Maria Repnikova, uh, who will talk about uh, the internet in China. So with over 730 million internet users in China today, um, a lot of the questions that are asked around the world, but also in our panel this morning, was whether or not the Chinese party state, the government is capable of managing this increasing um, internet usage or the growing public opinion sphere that's very active online. So whether this coexistence between the public sphere on social media and the Chinese political system can, can work in the long term. That was one of the core questions that came up um, in our round table today. So I wanted to try to answer these questions um, first by pointing out the shifts in uh, societal uses of the internet, but also to suggest some of the ways in which the Chinese party state has managed, has adapt, adapted and reacted to those changes. And finally, to mention the global ramifications of Chinese internet uh, policy. So first, to start with the challenges, why does this question even come up? Why should we bother to worry about this coexistence between society and the state uh, in China online? So the reason to worry or to be concerned or interested at least is that uh, Chinese society is increasingly very active on social media. Even though majority of people use the internet for commercial uses and entertainment, there's still quite a large percentage of users who are politically active online. And this activism manifests itself in several ways. The first way is that we see a more contentious public sphere um, as manifested by public opinion incidents. So all kinds of uh, discussions on important social issues take place solely on the internet. So we see discussions about the environment, for instance, people concerned with uh, the quality of air, polluting factories, uh, the quality of water, but also with uh, recently sexual harassment cases, both in universities, but also in kindergartens, in various public spaces. There are all sorts of contentious matters that only arise on the internet, and the state is you know, forced to respond to these matters um, immediately. The second nature of societal kind of concerns or, um, or uh, activism is through apathy. So many people are increasingly apathetic towards political propaganda. So the kind of political messages that come through official messages or official media are less effective, uh, less persuasive to Chinese citizens who are entertained through various social media channels uh, on a regular basis. And thirdly, there is a growing nationalism on Chinese social media. So we see more and more nationalism in favor of more radical foreign policy by the party state, which on the surface might appear as a positive thing. They're pro-state, pro-status uh, quo, but at the same time, they're also pushing for more uncompromising positions vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan uh, in the South China Sea context, also Russia and many other places. So we see this kind of three dimensions of um, social media activism um, that uh, the state is paying attention to. Of course, this uh, activism and this kind of societal uh, contention is not unique to China. We see similar issues uh, taking place also in the United States. So misinformation, fake news, the death or the atrophying of traditional media and so forth. These are kind of shared issues between the two countries. But arguably, the Chinese party state has been more um, multifaceted and creative and perhaps uh, more effective uh, in, some, on some, in some way in responding to these challenges. So how has it responded so far? The first response that many of you are aware of is increasing censorship and regulation of social media content. So simply containing, controlling for what's being told, how it's being discussed, um, 
um, through uh, various government institutions is something that's taking place more rapidly these days and more consistently um, under Xi Jinping. But the second and third dimensions that many people don't pay as much attention to is the growing Chinese uh, state's responsiveness to public concerns online. So there's been a and movement, uh, starting with the Huan period, um, but also shifting into the Xi era, with the growing responsiveness and studying, scientific kind of elements of studying Chinese public opinion. What, is the, what does the public talk about? What do they care about? So many, many officials are assigned to both open up their social media pages on Weibo and, and uh, WeChat, but also to constantly react and, and interact with the public, as well as to study public opinion through companies. So private sector is being delegated this job of understanding what are the key concerns, what are the sensitive issues, how can we respond to them quickly. And that's a very important element of, um, I think, governance that is, tends to be overlooked, that there's, there are thousands, if not millions, of people whose job is basically to interact with a society and to react to their concerns. And the third element uh, that, uh, of governance uh, of social media that's important to note here is the revamping of social media propaganda uh, online. So both in terms of setting up new media outlets and funding them by the government, such as the Shanghai's Peng Pai, the paper, as a prime example, but also uh, setting up social media platforms for the existing party outlets and also creative more kind of interactive and personalistic messages to describe President Xi as a warm-hearted, uh, you know, approachable, accessible leader uh, for the public. So all kinds of behind-the-scenes photographs, of his trips, uh, various apps to follow him where he's going. So just the creation of more connection between the state and society uh, uh, is very important for the Chinese state in managing this uh, social media outbursts um, of the public. How effective has this, have these efforts been? I think the effectiveness is somewhat mixed. On the one hand, uh, we're not seeing any large-scale crises, and for the most part, I think the Chinese society is still very supportive uh, of the status quo. But at the same time, uh, public opinion incidents and rumors and misinformation is still on the rise. It's, it hasn't really been kind of controlled for because of Chinese slowing economy and many different environmental crises and societal crises that are still happening. The public is very outspoken about those issues. So we, still, we see this kind of relationship as very much a tense coexistence. And I think that's how it's going to persist with the party state uh, surviving in a sort of crisis management mode on a daily basis, reacting and uh, adapting to the society just as much as the society adapts to the state. I think this is a very important element uh, to mention here. And the reason we should care about uh, these issues is not only because China is so important um, you know, for our relationship with, the, with this power, but also for the world, but also because China's mode of managing the internet, its uh, notion of internet sovereignty agenda, where the government is the key stakeholder in managing social media, is, is being very increasingly attractive to other countries around the world, uh, and many developing countries for that matter, especially in Africa. And I think this kind of idea of internet sovereignty versus internet freedom agenda that the US has been promoting is going to be a point of contention. And as I learned uh, through this roundtable today, uh, there's the technology that China is offering, in particular the AI technology that Kai-Fu has talked about in his talk, was that uh, many of these elements can be adaptable to developing markets, uh, more so than perhaps some of the American technologies have been. So I'll stop there and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Maria. And similarly, uh, similarly, you can see that there was a lot to cover. Um, I'd now like to turn it over to Kai-Fu Li, who, um, um, in addition to talking about uh, AI and the uh, economic implications of AI, uh, I'll also let him talk about his new book that he is book touring as we speak. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the plug. Yes, uh, I just published a book called AI Superpowers. And uh, today I'll focus on segments of the book that I think are most relevant. Um, especially since we're in Silicon Valley, I will um, try to uh, attack three myths that people here may have. The first is that Silicon Valley is the center of innovation in the world. And the second is that uh, AI is some fancy technology that only U.S. can be ahead in. And the third is that China is doing anything in AI due to government support. These three are patently false. So on the first point, uh, U.S. was, has been, the sole center of innovation for IT technologies. From the days of Windows, Intel, Netscape, Google, et cetera, uh, the whole world did revolve around the Silicon Valley. And China was, in fact, a copycat about 15 years ago. And uh, I think from the eyes of a Silicon Valley VC or entrepreneur, once a copycat, always a copycat, you are doomed. But from the eyes of a Chinese entrepreneur, um, you got to learn somewhere to get started. And um, it is true that if you're always a copycat for 10 years, you're probably not going to be um, great anytime soon. 
But among the million of copycats in China, there are perhaps 10,000 that have learned to build products. There are perhaps 1,000 that have become amazing, what I call gladiatorial entrepreneurs. And this evolved, if you just look at this, there are three periods of time, 10 to 15 years ago, always copycat. Uh, everything in China could be called the Google of China, the Amazon of China, the Yahoo of China. But five to 10 years ago, um, inspired perhaps by Silicon Valley, China started building equally good and sometimes better products than Silicon Valley. Uh, WeChat is better than WhatsApp. Weibo is uh, better than Twitter. Uh, at least in its usage, maybe in its product, maybe not in uh, diversity of content. Uh, but, uh, and also, you know, Chinese uh, Quora is better than America's Quora, and so on and so forth. Um, not always the case, but I think head to head about equal um, valuation on the market. If you look at all the Chinese internet companies and all the US, roughly equal. The third part is where China began to innovate. And this begins with companies like Ant Financial, uh, TikTok. Um, VIP Kid, uh, Mobike, and so on and so forth. These are innovations that don't exist in the Valley that the Chinese uh, entrepreneurs, through originally copycatting and then summarizing the ideas of understanding product user fit and then innovating for users' needs and then now exporting outside China. In the just the third category, uh, the, the, the companies I named plus a few more are worth about in the north of um, uh, $300 billion. And these are companies that it would take me five minutes each to explain what they are because there is no equivalent product uh, in the United States. So I think that's my first point. And if you study actually how the companies were made, I would argue that um, Stanford Business School should study them in parallel to Silicon Valley innovation. I'm not saying they're better, uh, they're just different. Uh, we have too limited time today. You have to look at my book to, uh, to read, the, <laughs> to read the, uh, the Chinese way. And I think they're worthy of studying. Uh, maybe I'll give one short summary sentence, which is that when you're in an environment where copying is not frowned upon, this is not IP theft, okay, just copying, sort of like Facebook, what they did to uh, Snapchat, if you will. Um, in a, if you're in an environment where copying a feature is not frowned upon, the only way to build a sustainable business is to build one that cannot be copied. And that is the root of the Chinese model of innovation. So that's the first point. The second point about AI, um, uh, actually the Chinese government had very little to do with AI up till the last year and a half. Um, the Chinese AI really began quietly about four to five years ago. VCs like ours and entrepreneurs who are who understood AI started at that point. Uh, two and a half years ago, when AlphaGo beat Li Sedo, I think that was the Sputnik moment that woke up China. Lots of people jumped into it, the valuations went up, and lots of money went into it, and all private up until the last year or so. So I would argue the fact that today, looking at the level of AI in China, um, the primary reason really is still that China has a very strong VC ecosystem and a strong entrepreneurial um, uh, spirit. And also on top of that, China had a couple of internet giants who are always the first beneficiaries of AI because AI requires large amounts of data and a single domain to optimize. And that's what the internet companies had. And that's what Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, and now uh, Toutiao and Didi and Meituan and others uh, have. So that uh, really began China in the right direction. Another really important reason is data. Uh, China has not only more users, but more usage per, uh, per user. I just looked at my app usage and uh, 56% um, of my time in the last uh, week, according to my iPhone, was spent in WeChat. So you can imagine how much data they have. When I use the American internet, I use, I, there's no app that has that much data. I think people use the Chinese apps more, they gather more data, um, and therefore more data creates better AI, which is uh, incredibly important. And the entrepreneurs also got more money. The VCs invested, um, about 30% more money in China for AI than they did in the US. Therefore, more money, great entrepreneurs. That, that has led to uh, today where the most valuable speech com recognition company, machine translation company, drone company, uh, computer vision company, face recognition company are all Chinese. So, and also among um, the Chinese startups, just in the last two and a half years, uh, about 15 have risen to become unicorns that is billion dollar companies. These are 
pure AI companies. They're, they're not, you know, internet company that also use AI. These are absolutely pure internet company. They build robots or computer vision or speech recognition or chips and so on. And we are fortunate to have been investors in, in five of them. So these are a lot of uh, evidence that has shown that China, because of its great entrepreneurs and ecosystem, uh, plus a lot of capital injected, and clearly a little bit of hype has developed this great AI uh, ecosystem. Of course, then the government came to the aid. So absolutely government is contributing to AI, but more in the way of uh, building infrastructure, such as um, uh, building a new city for autonomous vehicles, building a new highway to help safety on autonomous vehicles. And also <clears throat> in um, central government document that said AI is super important, and then let each um, uh, city find the ways to reward and attract more AI entrepreneurs or returnees or uh, established companies to move there. So the government definitely today has a role in AI is, um, is I think a, uh, a big um, plus element, but really what began AI, just for the record, is the entrepreneurs and VCs and the internet companies. Uh, that was the most important thing. And the last thing I want to talk about is that uh, AI, uh, I think, creates a huge amount of value. PwC estimates about $17 trillion. It also brings up a lot of issues, issues related to privacy, security, uh, job, job displacements. Um, and um, uh, we're probably running out of time, but just a few words. Because AI is really good at single domain optimization with large amounts of data, Therefore, AI can do the job of a lot of routine jobs. So if you think about all the jobs in the world, not your jobs, but the jobs in the world that are single domain, large data, objective function driven decision making, that is white collar and blue collar jobs, will cover a pretty large percentage of the world's jobs. So dealing with um, job displacement is one of the big priorities. And finally, to conclude, I think there's a lot of discussion about U.S. versus China. I think U.S. is clearly stronger in research and technology, probably by a decade or by 10x, however you want to look at it. But China is stronger in implementation and monetization. And for now, until the next breakthrough comes out, uh, implementation and monetization is where the action is. Uh, and Despite all the talks about U.S. versus China, I would like to think the challenges and opportunities that AI affords are bigger ones for us to pursue or face as opposed to any challenge that one country may have over another. So we are hoping there are ways we, uh, the two great countries can work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kai Fu. <clears throat> um, fascinating uh, presentation, and, and we follow it up with Elsa Kania who um, uh, presented a paper called AI Giants Entangled, or, or AI Titans, I'm sorry, Entangled. So Elsa, if you take it. Uh, thank you. It's uh, wonderful to be here, and I'm happy to be continuing the conversation after a very insightful day of discussions. So I'd say that a couple of themes that have cut throughout our conversations today have been, first, the question, can China innovate? I think, as you've just heard from Kai Fu Lee, the answer clearly is yes, especially in the context of today's emerging technologies from artificial intelligence to quantum computing. So the innovation is also extended to new models, as in the case of China's approach to managing public opinion on the internet. And I'll also talk briefly about how this innovation is playing out in the context of national defense. I think second, we've discussed how, has the, how will China's party state grapple with uh, new challenges ranging from demographics to persistently trying to manage a very dynamic uh, public opinion space on the internet to the uh, risks and opportunities that arise with uh, the advent of artificial intelligence. I think, I think it remains to be seen how adaptive the Chinese government will be in its responses to these opportunities and challenges going forward. And I think thirdly, we've, we've discussed over the course of the day, what are the implications of these developments in China both for uh, the future of the region and the world, and for the United States going forward, if uh, declining economic growth as China reaches perhaps the middle income trap could uh, cause a global slowdown, uh, the potentially cross-border ramifications of these demographic difficulties, and of course the potential for diffusion of China's model of content control and censorship around the world, along with the different t technologies used for surveillance as well as Chinese tech companies go global, and bring this China model uh, approach to the internet and communications with them. 
So in the context of artificial intelligence in particular, I approach these issues from the perspective of someone who's looked uh, primarily at the Chinese military and tried to understand how the Chinese military thinks about uh, modernization and, uh, the, uh, and strategic competition in what's been characterized as a new era of great power rivalry. And I think it is clear, though, evidently China's uh, tech sector will bring a lot of beneficial and commercial applications of these technologies. The U.S. and Chinese militaries, unsurprisingly, are also quite focused on the uh, applications of these technologies in national defense. This is occurring, I'd say, against the backdrop of a broader strategy for innovation-driven development that Xi Jinping is advancing that concentrates on how technology can be used to enhance all aspects of national power, from accelerating economic growth to enabling new capabilities in national defense. And in the context of AI, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of hype and sometimes fear about the impact of AI in the future of warfare. I think some of this is justified, and clearly there are strategists, including in the Chinese military, who believe that AI could lead to a new revolution in military affairs or is transforming the nature of military power. And there, the Chinese military, the People's Liberation Army, or PLA, as it pursues quite an extensive agenda of reforms to increase its jointness and capability to fight and win wars, is also looking at ways in which it can compete in emerging technologies, AI in particular, among them, and Chinese military strategists even seem to believe, and, there, and many in the U.S. and the rest of the world would tend to agree, that uh, the character of conflict is being transformed in quite uh, far-reaching ways uh, with, by today's emerging technologies, what the uh, uh, PLA sometimes describes as a shift from today's informatized ways of warfare, in which information technology is integral to military power, to a future in which warfare will be intelligentized, or in which AI-enabled capabilities for military purposes could change the military balance. And some of the ways in which this may play out going forward won't simply be in uh, the development of lethal autonomous weapon systems or killer robots, though clearly the Chinese military is looking at ways in which AI can be used, for instance, to enhance missile guidance or enable autonomous swarms of drones. But many of the near-term uh, implications of AI will be much, uh, much subtler, but also uh, quite uh, impactful applications, for instance, in enhancing intelligence uh, to, en to enable better decision-making by commanders, uh, in enabling and supporting functions such as logistics or planning, as well as uh, quite, there's quite a strong focus by the PLA on uh, the ways in which a uh, AI could enhance military decision making going forward, potentially enabling decision superiority on the future battlefield. And uh, AlphaGo, which as Kai Freely mentioned, was a Sputnik moment for the Chinese government, also influenced Chinese military thinking that an AI could perhaps in the future develop techniques and stratagems that humans cannot conceptualize and could therefore prove quite disruptive on the future battlefield. So again, as, uh, as, U as U.S. and China, uh, U.S. China military competition intensifies across multiple dimensions, including in technologies like hypersonics, uh, AI is a dimension of that overall competition, though I think I'd, I wouldn't say we're in an AI arms race, or at least that concept is incomplete insofar as AI uh, as a concept embraces a quite wide range of technologies with a multiplicity of applications, many of which are commercial to start. And uh, clearly there are a number of ways in which the U.S. and China can and should engage and cooperate in the development of these technologies, but there are risks associated with this, uh, this focus on AI in national defense, including perhaps new challenges in terms of crisis management, unintended escalation, given that AI technologies do remain quite nascent and brittle and can make errors no human would make. So I think reasons for caution and engagement on these uh, security and stability challenges going forward. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention also the ways in which uh, AI can be used in surveillance and ways that are being pioneered in China, including Xinjiang. And I think these do also raise tr troubling implications for the future of democratic governance going forward, especially when you look at the interrelatedness of China's tech sector with applications in defense and surveillance as the Chinese government advances a strategy of military civil fusion or civil military integration that seeks to combine and integrate uh, developments across these sectors going forward. So I think uh, a lot of challenges, but also reasons to uh, be excited about the positive potential of AI and to seek cooperation 
to mitigate the risks and potential consequences going forward. Thank you very much, Elsa. Thank you. And uh, what I'd like to do now is turn the floor over to you and to those who are out there in the Twitterverse. Uh, we have some roving mics, so if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand, and one right in the middle over here. Uh, thank you for sharing your insights on uh, some of China's opportunities and challenges. Um, it's good to hear a talk where the word blockchain technology wasn't used a single time. Um, but I think crypto economic incentives are sort of reshaping the internet and building sort of an alternative financial market and alternative governance systems. And so on the topic of governance, uh, and in light of like, you know, moving into a more decentralized future and China being a very centralized state actor, um, where do you see the challenges for China really to, uh, you know, embrace and really charge, charge ahead in terms of uh, taking advantage of innovation, how it's being captured in the future? Because it might change because the whole operating system will change uh, upon which a value is created. I guess that's for me. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we um, cryptocurrency is a uh, is still. I think the jury is still out. I I think your stance is very clear. Uh, I think China tends to look at technologies as giving something a try and then deciding to regulate it if it doesn't seem to go well. So um, that's how China got. Um, digital payment over the mobile. That's how you know, China got AI to be accepted so well. But on the crypto area, it did decide to regulate. And the reason it decided to regulate was there was a massive amount of money uh, being involved in money laundering, shipping money out when it's not legal. And also, there were a lot of um, uh, naive investors who got fooled into ICOs um, that were uh, fraudulent. So um, that was the basis for the decision. And uh, I think um, China going, so Innovation Ventures, a VC, uh, the only company we could invest in in that scenario was Bitmain, which was a, um, basically uh, chips and um, 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 machines that could be used for uh, Bitcoin mining. So it's a hardware company. Uh, we could invest in that, and that's actually something that China is very strong in. Bitmain is the largest um, um, Bitcoin mining company in, in the world. And uh, other than that, we could not find any legal grounds to make further investments. So going forward, um, I think that the government is um, basically taking the approach that blockchain is good, but uh, crypto and ICOs not legal, and watching US and EU on how they choose or not to choose to legalize that, and then see how it might be adopted. So to the extent that uh, crypto and ICO uh, or either one, uh, revolutionized the whole world like the internet did, I think China would be caught behind because of its regulation. But I gave the reasons for that. And to the extent that blockchain is the big technology that could be decoupled from cryptocurrency, then I think China is taking a proactive approach to find the applications. But to date, other than crypto-related, um, public chain related um, uses of blockchain, there hasn't been a killer app yet. So I think the whole world, including China, is uh, looking for that. Anyone else care to comment on that? I would just add quickly, I think uh, the Chinese government's approach to technologies like blockchain reflects a contradiction or tension sometimes between embracing innovation and being concerned about security and controllability, which are often the bywords used for describing these technologies and to the extent that any technology makes it possible for activists to resist censorship, as uh, feminists have done in trying to prevent censorship of China's Me Too movement and otherwise, or can enable anonymous activities online. I think there are concerns and attempts to ensure that innovation remains within the parameters and consistent with the objectives of the party state. Uh, the Chinese military, I believe, speaking of relevant applications, also seems to be exploring the use of blockchain, potentially, which could have defense applications and supply chain security and logistics. So I think a lot, a lot more to explore as these technologies evolve going forward. Uh, great comments. Uh, thank you all. Question, thinking about the future and what the central government's trying to do. Number one is there's a fair amount of debt that's been written about in the Chinese economy, uh, point one. Point two is at some point you have to save if you have a graying economy to supply you know, a retirement for people. 
my question is really around how does the government save enough money while trying to expand the economy so that they so that the government can provide retirement for this graying society that was articulated earlier I, I can I can take a crack at the graying aspect although I think that others will be uh, will have more intelligent quest, uh, responses for you on the government debt and the local debt um, in general, the, the strategy has to be to accumulate as much wealth now and to spur as much growth now as possible to try to catch up with or uh, even get ahead of the trajectory of graying. Because China is on track to go gray faster than any society, any large group in human history with the single exception of Japan, as you may know very well. Um, and uh, graying, in, uh, graying in affluent Shanghai or graying in affluent Beijing may not look uh, uh, like such a challenge, but when one goes out to the Chinese countryside, where actually the population is more uh, elderly than in the cities due to the migration of working uh, age people to the urban areas. You have, you've, got a big, uh, you've got a big question coming up. Uh, the Chinese government has been um, talking about and implementing uh, national pension policies and rural healthcare policies for over two decades now, but it's still very much a work in progress. And as in the USA, China has uh, generated an enormous amount of private wealth. It's just that the private wealth doesn't match up very well with the human need. Um, how is this going to play out in the decades immediately ahead? Um, I don't think we've seen a government plan for explaining this. Uh, I live with a certain amount of apprehension that the social uh, theoretician known as Darwin is going to solve the problem of need for the rural seniors. And I, I hope I'm proved wrong by this. Any other comments? I think um, during the course of our discussion, it it came up that, um, that, that clearly one of the overriding questions uh, is that how will China sustain the economic development into what is really the mid-century? Um, and, um, and without question, the emphasis on the new technology uh, and the developments that have been seen is, is clearly part of that. Uh, how will it improve productivity within China? Uh, one other aspect of our discussions included the fact that um, the financial crisis that uh, we went through shook the confidence in uh, what one would call the Western system. And then overlay that on the fact that um, as, as China is tackling some of its challenges and moving forward quite rapidly in the new technologies, and contrast that with the performance and the dynamic that exists in some of the Western uh, democracies. Uh, if you're in China, maybe there's a more optimistic view of that future uh, than what we might have here. Yes, ma'am. I'm just building off of what you just said there. Um, so. Western liberalism has been uh, pretty dominant in the past few decades, and we point to our um, the US, U.S. government system as um, a good one because we have a large, educated, healthy, wealthy populace. Um, and China has taken a very different approach. It's a very centralized approach. Um, and as their population becomes more wealthy and lives longer and becomes more highly educated, um, what are the top metrics that you guys use to measure the success of each system relative to another? Um, first and second uh, is to your point as China starts to match or possibly even exceed the US on some of these metrics um, What does that do for our messaging for what we think is the right style of governance to other countries and possibly even for the US? 
I can, I can make a couple of points, okay. but we'll see. So in terms of the Western liberal system as dominant and kind of the, I guess, the competition coming from China, um, I think I'll respond to the second part. I think there is a, a growing kind of concern uh, on the U.S. side about uh, how do you match the narrative, especially in developing contexts. And something I've been working on in my research is looking at China's kind of soft power initiatives and its uh, imagery in contexts that are currently receiving much less aid from the United States, uh, much less attention as well. And whereas, you know, the president of the U.S. is calling, recalling them by various names that are not very appealing. So China becomes a more appealing narrative for many of these places, both on the government level, but also societal level. And I think there's a lot of imagination about what Chinese model is and which parts of it could be implemented, how much can be learned from China in those places like Ethiopia and many parts of Africa and other developing contexts. So I think there is going to be more and more friction about the narratives, whereas you know, the US has to be more proactive about um, talking about the practical benefits of the liberal democracy, not just the ideology of that. Because for now, I think the message on the US side has been very rigid. It's about the ideological benefits. It's just simply a better system. There's no question about that. So China is kind of overlooked as the inferior system. But at the moment, I think many places are starting to question that. Is this really an inferior system? Or you know, is it working better? Is it more effective? Is it you know, producing more short-term results, especially economically and in terms of innovation. So I think the, the question here is also how the U.S. is going to reframe this, the messaging, reframe its policies to appeal to those places if we want to do that, and what sort of um, practical benefits are we going to highlight of this model, given the, benefits, the kind of experience of the financial crisis and various other disappointments that uh, we've seen. So I think it's, it's a really important issue that you're raising. And I would just add on the point of narrative, I think it's clear that the Chinese government has invested enormously in seeking to increase its soft power and the attractiveness of its model over the past uh, number of years. And at the same time, I think there are aspects of China's development that may be censored or controlled, but I think do paint a much darker picture. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the uh, situation in Xinjiang today where hundreds of thousands, if not by some estimates, close to a million Uyghurs have been detained and incarcerated and in would have been characterized as concentration camps, raising concerns over cultural genocide given the policies underway towards this Muslim ethnic minority, including taking children from their families and, uh, and policies justified by concerns over terrorism, but that seem to be far more akin to a collective punishment in terms of how that population is being treated. We've also seen under Xi Jinping uh, on one hand, he's advancing the China dream in a very rosy narrative of China's future. On the other hand, he's overseeing the retrenchment of authoritarianism in ways that I think are quite troubling and concerning, especially from the perspective of the uh, Im impact on Chinese society and uh, ba really going backwards in many respects, so including the crackdown on lawyers, the detention and arrest of the Feminist Five and uh, five young feminist activists who were arrested in the uh, spring of 2015 for trying to pass out stickers protesting sexual harassment on public transportation. And as a side note, Letta Hong Fincher's recent book, Betraying Big Brother, is a, a fabulous account of China's feminist movement and how that uh, is seen as a threat by, by the regime. So I think to some degree, there's a lot of reasons that the Chinese Communist Party has tried to uh, advance this narrative and its model, but I think they're also, I think it's also important to be cognizant of some of the uh, externalities or consequences that have arisen with its approach to governance. And I think the best thing the US can do in response is to try to uh, live up to our own values and improve our own democratic institutions and prove that our model can be successful and can be superior at the end of the day because because of our values, and even if we often are uh, incomplete in living up to them, I think there's hopefully reasons to continue fighting the right fight on that front. Right. I just right. want to add one quick point to that. I completely agree with you that um, there is this other side of the story, the darker side that perhaps is uh, damaging that soft power capability, but I think we have to differentiate between the different markets where Chinese narrative is being uh, spread to. So if you look at the market of the United States or the developed world, so to speak, I think that's where most of those stories are being uh, heard, monitored, and spoken about. So most of the uh, comments about Xinjiang have come out of the developed world. I mean, we haven't seen any, almost any comments from developing countries uh, critiquing China's position, uh, including its key partners in BRI, like Kazakhstan, where very few, there's very, it's a very tense relationship because they're benefiting so much from China's economic investment. So I think that there's a big differentiation between who is speaking out mm -hmm. and where is this darker narrative being kind of heard and um, used as a kind of a counterpoint to maybe resist some of these Chinese um, influence operations. Yeah, absolutely. I'd say even in the case of One Belt, One Road, clearly a lot of economic benefits being delivered, but also some concerns and backlash on the part of countries involved in some cases based on how the projects are being carried out. So I think that's definitely a, a mixed picture and uh, it will be interesting to see how this all develops going forward.
actually, looked like a question that didn't have any takers. Everybody's piling on now. Yes, so, so there, um, a great question and a tricky one. Um, I think the most distinctive and in one sense maybe the most interesting aspect of China's distinctiveness with respect to its model and governance still awaits us because we are right on the cusp of an extraordinary experiment which actually my colleagues know an awful lot more about than I will, but that's never stopped me from saying anything. Um, with the advances in e-commerce and with the advances in fintech, and the advances in uh, big data with the service of AI. Um, China is on the verge of being able to experiment with something which we might uncharitably call market totalitarianism in a way that has not been tinkered with anywhere else yet in human history. And the governmentization of the enormous amounts of knowledge about people's personal behavior, commercial behavior, preferences, is going to make at least for the potentiality of a radically different quality of government from anything that we have previously seen. Uh, in my own little bailiwick, I look at that with respect to population policy. Uh, let's say the Chinese government wishes to do a U-turn and go from population control antinatal to population control pronatal. If the nascent uh, social credit rating system uh, comes out as it's supposed to, we're going to see an awful lot of uh, signals to people. But it's not just in the population area where this will be implemented. It will be used by the party. It will be used by the PLA. It will be used by the, uh, uh, by the public security ministry. It will be used by economic planners. And what is this going to look like? I don't think we know yet. But stay tuned, because it may happen real soon and it's not only going to be the intended consequences which are going to be fascinating, it's going to be the unintended consequences. And there are a lot of other governments that are going to want to look at this. The, the only thing I would also add is that, you know, we can look at the technology, the march of technology, the human capital, um, but the planet also gets a vote. And I would submit that some of the great shocks that can be delivered uh, within Eurasia uh, are some uh, climate issues, water, um, and, and even though we can talk about artificial intelligence and, and how all this information can be used, um, I haven't heard during the course of our discussions how any of that is going to generate water, which I think is going to be one of the great challenges of Asia over the next couple of decades. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, then we'll go. No, d please. Um, each of you has given us an aspect of China. Now, at the risk of extending a little bit beyond our terms of reference, I wonder if any of you would comment on the implications of what you see for the United States. And in particular, if there's anything that the United States should do or should not do uh, with regard to the patterns that you have sketched out, if that's not an unfair question? It's a perfectly fair question. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and I think everyone here will have uh, an opinion, and Kaifu wanted to be first out of the block. So. Okay, so uh, based on the two messages I gave, one is that China has come up with a new way of developing very powerful, uh, very valuable companies. I think uh, U.S. could study that and view Silicon Valley's method as one way and the China approach as another way. It's, I don't, I'm not suggesting U.S. be a copycat, but I'm suggesting businesses, schools should study it and that it may be helpful to some entrepreneur that may benefit from some of the learnings from Chinese entrepreneurs. It's not fair to write them off as just copycats and actually could be useful in the U.S. Secondly, on the AI competition, um, the picture I painted was that China implementation would be stronger. It's had a faster acceleration path and probably going to create more wealth for China. But U.S. has a probably 10 to 1 advantage in its research prowess. And uh, the, the, the most powerful thing in the U.S. is the funnel that attracts the whole world's talent to study here. 
and some significant percentage stay. That's what, ha that's what has allowed the U.S. to, disproportionate to its population, produce brilliant Nobel scientists and uh, very valuable companies. So continuing to attract such great talent on a worldwide basis and giving them visas and allowing them to stay would be a continuation of that funnel. And I think, um, um, you know, what I didn't mention was, well, what if a country came up that with the next breakthrough? What if that were patented or, or were invented by its uh, AI giant and stayed within the walls of that giant? Well, U.S. is the odds-on favorite to make that disruptive cre creation and benefit from it. Uh, but if the funnel is disrupted and um, um, not all the people are allowed to study here or some people uh, aren't given visas, they got the great American education and then were sent home, then that would be a disruption of a funnel that has operated well for perhaps a century. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, if, you, if you do not just the headcount approach that I do, but also try to look at a little bit beyond the headcount at human resources and human potential, uh, you, you don't have to be an alarmist to see a very plausible path for a China economic slowdown. Um, maybe the slow growth in China would be something that people in other countries would be praying for. Maybe it'd be... Uh, 3%, more than 3%. Um, but that's, if such a slowdown does occur in an orderly manner, um, this is something that will have a great impact on the world economy, including the US. Um, if China changes from its extraordinarily high savings rates towards a more consumption-oriented economy, that's also going to have big implications for the international flows of capital, and it'll have implications for interest rates and scarcity of capital around the world. Um, we should at least, I think, be ready to entertain that possibility of a future. And one of the things which I think that means is that we should look more at what we can do to make our own system and economy healthy and vibrant and working towards a formula where we can generate prosperity for all. And maybe if we generate prosperity for all here, we generate a little bit for the rest of the world too. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I think that I would respond with three points. Um, the first one is that I think we should see the kind of Management of internet governance in China is also a case study that uh, we could pay attention to. So similar to innovation, I think the responsiveness of um, the state to public concerns, the kind of adaptiveness to public opinion management is a feature that's quite unique, I think, to the Chinese context in comparison to other non-democratic states, but also perhaps even in contrast to democratic systems. So I think that kind of model for responsive internet management when it comes to public opinion is something to be uh, watched closely as a potential kind of thing to also learn from. I'm not talking about censorship, but responsiveness to public grievances. Uh, the second point here is I think we have to understand and study the potential attractiveness of the China model um, as complementary, but also as an alternative to the US, especially in developing contexts and in political systems with author authoritarian underpinnings. So I think we have to be clear that you know, the US is no longer the only uh, way to go. There's, there's, there are other models, and China is presenting an aspiration for many of these places. So we have to be clear on at least acknowledging that and learning you know, how this takes place. And thirdly, I think when we try to develop our own or promote our own system, in particular the internet freedom agenda, we need to be both taking it seriously, but also uh, explaining some of the pragmatic, the kind of practical benefits of this um, alternative model, not just again saying that it's simply a better way to go, but why is it better? How does it help um, stimulate growth in the long term? How does it benefit your political system? How does it help your society, uh, empower it, et cetera, as opposed to simply say that this is just a better way because of our values. I think that's no longer going to work. And in addition to that, again, echoing the comments from Nick, that improving our own domestic system, of course, is key to any sort of image globally. And in, the key issue here is the image of our own companies. I think the big tech companies have undergone a lot of pressure and uh, a lot of public critique in terms of the data breaches and or, or other sorts of scandals that make it less credible on the global market. So I think to improve the internet freedom capability, we also have to improve the image of the companies and their responsibility to the public. Thank you. If I could just uh, jump in, I think, you know, as uh, Kai Fu mentioned, that there's the, there's the development of the technology and then there's the implementation. I'm not sure those are the exact words you used, but I think that we have become enamored with the fact that you know we had the breakthrough technology. And I would submit that as I look to our demographic going forward, 
Um, and if you look at the, the percentage of, of, of Americans who are really digging into some of the uh, disciplines that will enable and allow for implementation, we are grossly deficient. And clearly, uh, we will not be a centrally managed society or a centrally managed initiative. But I think that um, what we should strive for is a centrally enabled approach. And clearly, um, we have not brought together, and I throw a lot of stones at the legislative branch in this regard, um, you know, the education, commerce, and what I would call the national security writ large, uh, to come together and say, how should we go forward? What are the policies that will enhance and enable and facilitate, um, you know, the United States moving into a, a favorable position? And I've neglected this young man over here for uh, too many rounds. So, uh, We'll go to him, and, and Elsa, did you have something? I was just going to respond to the prior question, if I may. So just quickly to your, to your point, I'd say I see three main concerns and implications in terms of the trends in China today. First, I'd say Chinese military modernization is starting to change the balance of power in the region and beyond in ways that pose novel challenges to the U.S. military going forward. I think second, uh, to... Uh, to the point of innovation, I think uh, clearly China is innovating, and if we see science and technology as integral to national power and competitiveness across all dimensions, then the U.S. has to be more serious about how we can advance our own rejuvenation, so to speak, which means uh, investing in basic research going forward. That's something the Chinese government is doing quite extensively and that the U.S. used to do, but has not uh, done quite as seriously uh, in recent years. Definitely a STEM education is also imperative in terms of thinking about talent. I'd say if there is an arms race in AI today, the main battlefield or the main uh, focus of competition right now is for talent. And thirdly, I think, uh, to Kaifu's point, also immigration and, com and making sure that our innovation ecosystems remain open and inclusive. And finally, I would just say to the point of what I, what I sometimes call entanglement, the fact that the U.S. and China at the level of the U.S. national defense strategy, our focus is great power rivalry and strategic competition but our economies are deeply interdependent in ways that can both be mutually beneficial but create uh, sources of risk and uh, potential for, for exploitation in technologies like artificial intelligence. There's also uh, quite extensive cooperation and synergies among our innovation ecosystems. Again, often a positive thing, but something that can become more fraught as there is a focus at the policy level on competitions. How do we how, how do we balance and manage this relationship going forward as we enter what may prove to be a new era of U.S.-China relations? I think that's a policy and strategic question that is still very much uh, open to debate and uh, result in some tricky, tricky dynamics going forward. Hi, my name is Manny. One of the things that I do here is um, research around tech policy. Uh, my question is primarily for Li Kaifu, given your argument um, that Chinese tech companies are better at implementation than American ones. I was just hoping that you could give me and others in the audience more detail and color about the companies and the technologies that are crucial to implementing government projects of internal surveillance, like in Xinjiang, but also for foreign policy purposes through the military. Well, I was talking about commercial, so I'll give a commercial example, if that's okay. Um, so if we take um, the Chinese business model, the U.S. model, you, know, you guys probably use uh, Yelp or Groupon or, or a company like that. The Chinese equivalent is a company called Meituan. And the Chinese business model is let's own and change the, Chinese, the way Chinese people eat. And the way in which they have done so is they have uh, figured out that if they could deliver food to any home uh, within 30 minutes for 70 cents per delivery, then they'll change the way people eat. Then they just go after it, um, month after month, five cents, 10 cents lower per month, losing billions of dollars in the process, but eventually arriving at that goal. And if you actually visit China today, everyone's eating differently. Um, probably people use Meituan for takeout more than they eat out, and maybe as much as they cook. Because imagine if you had that capability, 30 minutes, 500 restaurants to your home, and costing only 70 cents per delivery. And the way in which you get at that is really operational excellence. 
is not afraid to do really ugly uh, work, like managing 600,000 people for minimum wage and watching for turnover of 30% per year, buying the cheapest um, um, electrical motorbike uh, possible and get batteries exchanged and deal with all that and bet your whole company on it. So um, it is a very risky, gutsy, uh, speed, operationally intensive, top-down directive kind of a model. But when you accomplish it, your opponent has no real way of attacking you unless they also put billions of dollars at risk and go after this five, 10 cents a month at a time. So this is kind of the, an example of the operational excellence model. And this is what, not what Silicon Valley preaches. Silicon Valley prefers a company like Instagram. 11 engineers sold for a billion dollars and you know, floating at the air and then just dealing with technology and not do the ugly work of dealing with offline. I think in the future, most of money will be made integrating online with offline. And offline is an uglier world that I think entrepreneurs have to learn to deal with and manage and take risk and become operational excellence. Hopefully that example was helpful. Uh, hi, I guess related to the question about Meituan, uh, which is how do you see the demographics and the technology interacting? Because part of that Meituan story is also that you can hire Chinese drivers to deliver it very cheaply. Um, and whether you see other examples of the current state of Chinese demographics shaping the current state of the Chinese tech sector, as well as in the future, how you expect that relationship to evolve. Okay. Well, certainly a lot of Meituan's capabilities depend on the migrant workers that my colleague talked about earlier. Without that, I mean, who would work for such a lower wages, right? So that was the critically taking advantage of a lower paying uh, actually workforce without hukou, um, but they're in city and making more money than, than township. Another very important way demographics with respect to um, internet is is happening in China is that actually China has multiple demographics in terms of um, internet usage and uh, education level and sophistication. There are probably about 300 million people in China who uh, use the internet much as we do and probably another 200 million people who use it more as a young, frivolous, fun, um, wasting time kind of thing, like some of the millennials do, but, uh, but more like Southeast Asian young people do. And then there are probably another 200 million people who just came online who are relatively naive but now have the ability to pay, and they're in even further backward uh, towns or even villages. And what is, I think, interesting is a lot of the new internet, so each of the three groups are upgrading in their internet usage every year. So you see new entrepreneurs evolving in each of the three categories. Um, when I said there are $300 billion of companies created in the last three or four years, they're actually largely targeting the second and third categories because these are, it's almost like a country within a country emerging um, with different usage patterns. So if you look at uh, Toutiao, ByteDance, uh, TikTok, Kuaishou, they're targeting the second tier. If you look, look at Pinduoduo, they're targeting kind of the, the third tier. And what is interesting is the entrepreneurs continue to look at who are the people coming online and what can we do to make money. And then as those people upgrade and become more sophisticated, what might they migrate to? So that, this is a major part of studying the user of any internet entrepreneur. Furthermore, what might be interesting is that the second group is now targeting Southeast Asia, and in some cases, India, because the demographics are perhaps similar. Um, and then the third is perhaps looking at Africa. And I think that is probably the way in which the Chinese software will go beyond the borders of uh, mainland China. Uh, we have a tweeted question. Yes, and this actually picks up on where you left off. One of our live stream viewers asks, uh, Maria, you mentioned the internet sovereignty model in China, uh, and that, that has been viewed as attractive in some developing countries, especially in Africa. Could you please talk a little bit about how those developing countries would implement that model, and whether that model might be an opportunity for Chinese companies, especially the big tech giants, to expand, as Dr. Lee just mentioned. Sure. 
Um, so there are several ways in which it's uh, being implemented or at least talked about in the, in the context of Africa that I've observed in my work. Uh, the first is the aspirational way, so simply the idea that um, people in, in the government, at higher levels of the government, find it very exciting how effectively the Chinese uh, government manages to you know, deal with the internet and public opinion online, especially censorship. So there's a lot of uh, comments brought up in my research about the fact that we want to be like China, we want to aspire to this mode of managing uh, social media, that it's something that's very efficient and the hope for learning from China. The way they're learning is that many of these officials travel to China on um, delegations. There are over 5,000 officials already trained. Uh, in China from Ethiopia alone, and they get trained in various governance um, strategies, including the visits to official media outlets and meeting with propaganda officials. So there is some sort of learning or explanation of uh, Chinese internet governance um, to those officials. But the second way is, is exports of technology, and Chinese companies, including uh, Huawei and ZTE, are becoming increasingly involved uh, in that market, uh, especially in Ethiopia. They're the two major players, actually investing heavily in the telecom industry, uh, but also AI is getting into that uh, region as well, with Zimbabwe recently signing a deal uh, to import some of these um, AI technologies from China. So there, there are more and more examples of Chinese technologies being used um, as kind of uh, the, the um, alternative to perhaps Western technologies or their own domestic ones, which are weaker in, in comparison. Uh, but there are also some, I think, uh, perhaps doubts or some um, challenges to the implementation of China's internet sovereignty model. And first of all, most officials mentioned that as aspiring as China might be, they don't have the human capability or technological capability to, to be like China. So they, there's no mini China at the moment anywhere in the world. Uh, because China, as I mentioned, hires thousands and thousands of people to monitor social media. It has you know, incredible investments into the tech sector, which other countries cannot replicate. So essentially, there's an aspiration at a high level, but there isn't as much action, with the exception of importing some of these technologies, including surveillance technologies and uh, increasingly AI as well. Thank you. So making a lot of money is one thing, and then holding on to it is another. Uh, so you know, right next door in, in Russia, the richest guy, Katarovsky, a couple years ago, spent a couple years in prison, now lives in Switzerland in exile, right? Uh, if I were a Chinese entrepreneur, how concerned would I be about that fate? I, I have no idea, and it's just, yeah, I'm very interested to hear what yeah, you all have to say. That's for me, I guess. Sure, so yeah. not okay. Mine, yeah. Well, I think the entrepreneurs are in the have-nots state, right? I think the entrepreneurs we fund don't think about this issue because they haven't got a lot of money, and um, so the, they just want to become a haves. And then, if you look at the pattern of the people who are in the haves, I think obviously a number of them want to diversify their wealth so that it's not all in China. And one such way to do so would be an IPO in. Um, U.S. or Hong Kong, and that is one of the reasons that's uh, making that path attractive. Can I just add, uh, you mentioned the Russia example, but I would argue that the entrepreneurs that got in trouble in Russia were very politically outspoken. So that's a very big difference. So they, they actually supported um, democratization movements in Russia. They supported civil society. They supported marches against Putin. Those are the kinds of individuals that went to jail and um, you know, ended up in exile. It's not an everyday entrepreneur in Russia that gets into that trouble. And I think the same could be drawn to China, where most of these entrepreneurs are not going across those borders or boundaries of questioning the entire system and supporting civil society activism. I would just add, though, that when one of the most famous women in China, movie star Li Bingbing, can be uh, disappeared and extrajudicially, seemingly for reasons of tax evasion, and just completely go off the grid for months, I think that does. That's a pretty clear signal that uh, those who are rich and successful need to pay their sh fair share and uh, mm -hmm. need to abide by uh, the relevant uh, procedures and whatnot, just like anyone else. So I, th I imagine that, that given her prominence and the a dramatic nature of this case that would be a pretty clear signal to anyone, uh, entrepreneur or otherwise, who uh, may think about uh, trying to evade taxes or enrich themselves or simply be too successful by some definition. Thank you. I have a very simple question. Uh, psychologically, if you can enlighten me, uh, your personal opinion, when do you think President Xi Jinping will be as active on social media as President Trump? <laughs> What's, what do you think is he thinking? President Xi is actually very active on social media, but not directly himself, but through various social media startups and companies that have been created under him uh, within official media outlets that promote his image um, excessively. So there are, there are many images of him, his speeches, uh, images of him visiting abroad, again, the maps of where he's going. So his image is actually being very heavily promoted, but he himself individually would not tweet or speak out in the same direct manner as President Trump. Unlikely, I think. Um, 
My question has to do with equity and inclusion. All of you on the panel at some point or another have talked about uh, equity as it relates to rural residency or age, et cetera. Um, Dr. Lee, you talked about the haves and the have nots. So my question is, as a nation, China would seek stability and thus seek equity and inclusion because historically when we don't have that, it leads to first guards and gates and then revolutions. And second, part two is how can technology and or innovation actually help support equity and inclusion versus what it seems to have done historically, which is create a digital divide and sometimes a digital apartheid. Okay, I'll, I'll take the first uh, crack at this. Uh, there are some, I mean, a lot of the AI discussions are focused on commercial and military uses, but there are many other uses that are, I think, universally beneficial and also um, pushes towards inclusion. And in particular, that's uh, healthcare and education. And those are actually our largest areas of new investment areas because we want to um, help those two areas. Um, in education, for example, um, in China, there are top teachers who are really good in top cities, but uh, in rural areas, very poor teachers. And new technologies are actually connecting them by using video conferencing uh, so that one teacher can teach 800 kids with a clicker for interaction. And then um, face recognition and other AI can be used to identify to the teacher which students may need help in certain areas. And we're funding three companies that are working together uh, towards that goal. And that would hopefully make education more inclusive. And healthcare, I think the long-term goal is that a medical diagnostic tool would become so good that a nurse practitioner would be as good as a doctor of today. And to the extent that happens, poorer regions of China or any other country can be potentially benefited from that. And hopefully this Sunday or next Sunday, uh, I'll be on 60 Minutes talking about the uh, efforts we're making in those areas. And if I could just, uh, my comment earlier about a more integrated approach that we should have. I um, have the pleasure of not living in a major metropolitan area. I live in, in uh, rural Virginia. And it's disheartening to see the number of schools that are closing um, because of lack of teachers and funding and what have you. And I think that what Kai Fu just talked about, where he talked about rural China, I would submit that in the United States and some of the areas that have been hard hit uh, economically, that these are areas where I think should be a priority for our country to be looking at how to apply some of that technology. So how do we make sure that we don't end up with a world of have not, haves and have nots in the following way? Take healthcare, for example. Uh, those of us who have privilege will always get second opinions, will go to the best doctors, call a friend and what have you. And the rest of the planet might get algorithmic medicine through a kiosk in a corner of a school or a pharmacy or what have you. How do we make sure that it's not the way food ended up in our planet, right? We focused on yield per acre versus nutrition per acre. So the yield per acre on our planet has gone up. The nutrition per acre has plummeted. Many in this room participate in farm to fork movements and have organic foods. And the rest of the world gets fast food, very efficiently produced, very cheap. But the ripple effect in the healthcare system is awful. How do we make sure we don't do that again? Well, I'll answer on healthcare. I don't know about the agriculture one. Um, in healthcare, my belief is that the, the, if you look at the world today, the ultra-rich get A-plus medical treatment. Um, those of us in the room might get A-minus or B-plus treatment. And then the really poor get F treatment, right? My, my, I have long-term confidence in AI that it can bring the bare minimum to like a C so that everyone can have that. And then above that, there will still be this disparity. Yeah. I'd mention one other area of exclusion, although this doesn't have so much to do with uh, technological innovation. This is the HUCO system that I mentioned earlier in, uh, in my uh, remarks. Um, in some sense, it's a bit of a mystery why this uh, arrangement, this peculiar institution uh, continues from year to year. 
People in the Chinese government have been talking about re-examining this, which is kind of code language for abolishing this, for a couple of decades. And yet it continues with some innovations. Uh, but the, uh, the current urbanization drive plan anticipates uh, 200 million or more uh, non huko Chinese living in big cities in 2020 at the end of the first uh, uh, tranche of the plan. So why is this? I can see two reasons. Okay. Reason number one just has to do with public finance. The way that things work in urban China today, the migrants are a cash cow. They come in, they, uh, they pay, uh, but they aren't allowed to obtain social services. Um, this, is a problem, this is a policy problem that could be solved really quickly really quickly, but it would take a commitment from the central government to embrace the financial situation for the urban areas. And that hasn't happened yet. The migrants are just too easy to exploit. The second thing has to do with the whole question of public order. Um, you'll recall that back in the crash of 2008, early 2009, uh, untold millions of migrants in China, maybe 20 million, maybe more, were sent back from the cities to the countryside. How was that done? It was done through their hukou papers. I don't think that that probably uh, diminished the government's appetite for keeping that particular mechanism for social control. So uh, for all sorts of reasons having to do with humanity and well-being and human security, we might want to see this thing gotten rid of, but there's no plan to get rid of it anytime soon, I'm afraid. Can I just add one point to the... Sure. Just uh, one follow-up to the equity question. I think it's social media platforms themselves, I think, serve as a great example in China of both inclusion and exclusion at the same time. So on the one hand, people have much more access to voice their grievances, and most of their responses happen through social media. So people start talking about pollution or food safety uh, crises, um, sexual harassment, all sorts of really hot societal issues start to emerge online, and then the, the government sees the need to react. But on the, on the other hand, those who are engaged in those debates are mostly urban middle class individuals uh, that have access to technologies, but also who are literate, who are able to frame their messages correctly, and of course who have many followers online. And I think that kind of um, example is not unique to China. It's also present in many democracies as well. So there's both an inclusion of voicing concerns, but exclusion of who gets to voice them at what time. Um, thank you. I'm trying to go back to the theme of China in an emerging world. Uh, a couple of questions ago, there was, um, you had comments about the US Western liberal model of democracy and you know parts of the Washington consensus as a protagonist as against um, the emergence of a new uh, Chinese model of social management, uh, political management domestically or otherwise. Um, I come from a small island state within the Pacific. So quite apart from the perspective of a US um, you know, protagonist, four countries in the Asia Pacific, when we look at the history of uh, US ideological advocacy um, versus what the Chinese Communist Party is doing through the United Front Work Department, uh, making some countries within the Pacific region rather uncomfortable. These are both, in a sense, exercises of soft power, and you mentioned the word yourself, uh, Maria. How much of an equivalence, moral or political, can we draw between these two exercises of, uh, of soft power? And if you were one of these countries, and given the backdrop of American apparent ambivalence towards what's happening in Asia, uh, certainly with the change in administrations, what would you say as a message to countries in the Asia Pacific um, trying to deal with you know, the, the two protagonists, the US with the Washington consensus on one side and the emerging Chinese model of uh, governance? Thank you, that's a great question. My next book is actually exactly on the subject of the two stories speaking to each other and, and how, um, how much moral equivalence there is between them is something I'm still exploring, but I guess my preliminary response is that some of the initiatives are quite parallel. So for instance, trainings um, you know, of elites and so forth, that's something that both the US and China are doing. Uh, both of them are also spreading messages through official media channels, so something like VOA versus Xinhua News Agency, 
both of them are using uh, state-funded media to spread their messages and, of course, to set up various cultural events, attractiveness of the people themselves, their culture, the nation. I think that's something that, again, both of them uh, are doing. One big distinction between the two in this case is the economic investments and infrastructure building. And I think that's something that's been a point of contention around the world, so the kind of debt trap diplomacy uh, that some have accused of China as pursuing. And, of course, the United States has not been investing nearly as heavily into public infrastructure anywhere outside the United States. So the debates that I've heard about was whether U U.S. has to kind of up its game and invest more or whether it should seek other types of um, kind of channels or solutions or imageries because we cannot afford to invest as much as China can through state-owned enterprises um, globally. So I think that that economic issue is probably the most contentious because it indebts people into, um, you know, creating certain partnerships with China which might not be equitable or transparent. And I think one of the pieces of advice I would give to um, the smaller countries is to make sure that there's as much transparency as possible at every level when it comes to these engagements. Because I think the, the biggest complaint that I've heard about was that people don't know what the loans are actually exactly for, how much time do they have to repay them, and what happens if the loan is not being repaid. So what happens you know, if you cannot repay? Do you, does China get to own a certain piece of infrastructure? Does it get access to certain resources instead? What's the outcome? I think this, this is very much a developing issue. So transparency is very, very key, and the role of civil society as well as the government is very important here to raise that issue, to kind of bring them to the public itself. So thank you. And I, I just add a, well, a great question, and I think the major divergence, as you pointed out, uh, between American soft power and some of China's activities that can be characterized as soft power is that in some cases these efforts can be covert, corrupt, and coercive, as the Australian government has criticized. You mentioned United Front work, which has become a major source of debate and controversy, given some of what the United Front Work Department has undertaken is more gained, more aimed at influence and interference in ways that I think are not, not, not quite accurate to say that this is soft power when some of it can be aimed at influence through indirect and sometimes uh, far, far from transparent means, including in some cases generating corruption along the way. So I think that uh, to highlight Marie's point, I think transparency, both with regard to the nature of Chinese uh, commercial activities and the Chinese government's activities uh, is, is critical going forward. And I think for nations in the Pacific to become more aware of these issues and to continue to look for ways to uh, increase transparency and sort of be aware of ways in which uh, the United Front Work Department in particular can generate uh, potentially problematic uh, ramifications in terms of uh, some of what it is undertaking, as we've seen in Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific. And I think going forward, the US can hopefully uh, hopefully continue to shed light on these issues. And for those of you who haven't seen it, the National Endowment for Democracy had a great report out on sharp power last December, which def differentiates uh, sharp power more aimed at penetrating other, penetrating other countries' information space and exercising influence in ways that can be coercive relative to soft power, which is more sort of influence in the form of attraction. And I think uh, hopefully the U.S. will also can be become more engaged in supporting infrastructure and investment going forward. And though I think it remains to be seen whether that'll happen under this administration or how, how policy will play out in the years to come. Yeah, so um, I'm actually interested in going back to the question of uh, digital equity and social media that we touched on a bit earlier. So um, right now in the US, a lot of what we're looking at is an increased backlash in the developing world to social media expansion, whether that's ethnic conflict in Myanmar, whether that's the free basics projects a few years ago in India. So given those kinds of recent developments, I'm wondering in the context of the internationalization of Chinese social media, such as WeChat, which is rapidly expanding in Southeast Asia, is that an opportunity for them to expand this kind of network sovereignty model elsewhere? Or does that look like a risk that is posed to Chinese social media companies as well. Okay, so um, in terms of the decline of, I guess, the uh, legitimacy of some of these Western social media companies, I completely agree, and that's something I brought up earlier in my points, is that it gives space and opportunity for some of the Chinese companies to go forward in those markets. So I do agree that it creates certain spaces, but I would say that so far from what I've observed in terms of the usability of these apps, is that um, it's primarily being used by people who have something to do with China. So especially when it comes to WeChat, for instance, it's being used in classrooms or where Chinese is being taught so students can communicate with their teachers. It's being used by employees of Chinese companies, officials who deal with China, anybody who has close contact with China. But so far, I don't see that as becoming an international app in the sense of replacing uh, Facebook, for instance, or WhatsApp. So I think there's kind of a, a more narrow usage at this time, but it doesn't mean that it eventually will not uh, become big enough to encompass other uh, modes of communication, not solely China-related. That's, that's my observation, my research. Thank you.
Uh, one of the things that I would like to do before we thank the panelists is to acknowledge uh, the individual whose idea this series of lectures was, and that is uh, Secretary George Schultz, who planted the seed and has made this possible. The, the papers that have been the basis for this discussion and a summary of the discussion will be available from the Hoover Press in about a month. Also, outside, there is wine and cheese for anybody who wants to stand around and talk some more. Thank you all for coming. And please thank the panelists. <laughs>